All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, Nathan. How are you? I'm fantastic, and I'm happy to be back on the show today because you sent me the show notes, and it's a return to my favorite, my favorite long-running series on the Copywriters Podcast. Old Masters, um, explain it. Elmer Wheeler may have been the best paid copywriter of all time on a dollars per word basis. In the 1930s, Texaco paid him $5,000 to come up with this question. Is your oil at the proper level today, sir? In 2021 money, that's the equivalent of about $95,000 for nine words or more than $10,000 for each of those nine words. But those nine words had some other dollars attached to them as well. Texaco estimated gas station attendants who asked customers the question, is your oil at the proper level, sir? Ended up opening one quarter of a million car hoods and you can bet selling lots and lots of extra motor oil soon after they did. Mm. Now, by 1938, Elmer Wheeler had worked out tested sentences, tested selling sentences for over 5,000 products, according to an article in The New Yorker. One of those sentences for Barbasol shaving cream reportedly increased sales by 300%. In 1940, he wrote a book called Sizzlemanship, More Than 2,000 Successful Selling Pitches, to command instant attention and buying action. It is out of print today, but there's a Kindle edition available for a few dollars. We'll put a link in the show notes. Elmer Wheeler is definitely one of the most interesting, and I'm sorry to say overlooked old masters in copywriting, but we're gonna do something to correct that overlooked part today. I have a hard copy of the book, as I just showed you. I poured over it to find a few examples of his tested selling sentences we could look at today. But before we do, here are three sentences that aren't really selling anything, but have been tested over 200 times. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance and business opportunity, You may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. Now, remember, there are more than 2,000 tested selling sentences in this book. Even if we were to read them one after another without saying anything else, that would take several podcasts. Um, To give you an example of one of the tested sentences, the Barbasol sentence that I mentioned before, which is cut your shaving time in half, that one that increased sales 300% was the winner of a test of 141 different sentences. Elmer Wheeler was as dedicated to testing as Claude Hopkins was. But we can't go over all 2,000 sentences that emerged as winners today. So what I've decided to do is find five categories of sentences that would give every copywriter a real edge once this information is incorporated in their thinking and their copy with examples of winning sentences from those categories. And then we'll talk about how you can use these lost insights in your copy. Elmer Wheeler was ahead of his time nearly 100 years ago, but we can all benefit from his timeless market-tested wisdom. So let's get started. First, speaking in your customer's language boosts sales. And this is from the book. A vendor was walking through a train, sta- a train, a moving train. A vendor was walking through that train shouting, orange juice, fine orange juice. An old lady called him over and said, is it freshly squeezed? He said it was, and she bought some. As he went to the next car, Elmer Wheeler says, I heard him shouting, Freshly squeezed orange juice, freshly (laughs) squeezed orange juice, and his sales practically tripled. 
The point here is how to turn a question or an objection into part of your pitch. Let's look at it this way. Good copy comes out of real conversations with customers. The best copy comes out of what your customers tell you they want and putting that into your copy in their own words. And that's what the orange juice vendor did. Clearly it was a test, but it paid off big time for him. And this story here also shows the big problem with what I'm going to call willful branding, where you're just forcing certain words that you want to be your identity, your brand identity on your customers. Could work, but if you're not in sync with how your customers think and how they talk about what they're thinking, you're running a big risk. The risk is what you say won't reach them in a way that makes them more likely to buy. Yes, it is possible to force your language on your customers, but again, it's just as likely what you say won't work in increasing sales. Marketing pride and hubris can get in the way of a lot of sales. But how do you find out what are the words your customers use? The answer is simple, but actually doing what the answer suggests is not always easy. The answer is simply talk with your customers and listen carefully. I remember a client of mine, the great Tony Alessandra, made a very important distinction. Listening is not the same thing as hearing. Listening is a skill you can develop and improve. Tony has a PhD, but listen to his bio. Dr. Tony Alessandra has a streetwise college smart perspective on business, having been raised in the housing projects of New York City to eventually realize success as a graduate professor of marketing, entrepreneur, business author, and Hall of Fame keynote speaker. The key word in that bio is streetwise. I've never asked Tony, but I have a really strong hunch that he learned a lot more about listening from growing up in the streets of New York than he ever did in a college classroom. To turn to another legend in sales and copywriting, our own Gary Halbert, remember how his method of creating blockbuster sales West letters worked? He would take his copy into a bar and show it to ordinary people who are just like the prospects he would be mailing to. He would listen closely to how they responded. If they told him his writing was fine, he knew he had a loser on his hands. If they demanded to buy what he was writing about, then he knew he had a winner. Thoughts? Any, any thoughts on that? You know, <laughs> what I think of when I hear that story, and I've heard that story so many times, the cojones on Gary Halbert to walk up to random people in the bar who are trying to relax and have a beer and spend some time with maybe the girl that they're trying to get into bed. And he's like, Hey, do you mind if I pitch you something real quick? <laughs> I always, I always just thought to myself like, man, that takes a lot of balls. Yeah. Cajones are us. That's him, man. <laughs> uh, for sure. I agree. All right. Well, let's go to uh, the second category or idea from Elmer Wheeler. And the essence of this idea is how you name your upsell matters. So Elmer Wheeler says, a woman puts words written out for a telegram down on the counter. And a word of explanation, you know what a telegram is or what it used to be? You might not. Um, it was a fast way to send a written message long distance via Western Union. Um, it would, you'd send it to him, the teletype operator would write it in, it would go over the wire, it would get to the destination office, it would get printed out, and then it would be delivered by a uniformed Western Union messenger to your designated recipient. Got that? Okay. Back to Elmer Wheeler. After the woman hands the message to the clerk, most of them would say, straight wire? And straight wire is the in-house term Western Union used, and customers had no idea what it meant. So the woman would say, what is a straight wire? And the clerk would say, it costs more, but it goes out now. And the customer would say, oh, it doesn't have to out right this minute. And the clerk loses the additional sale. But Elmer Wheeler says, the clerk who sells more says, fast wire? And most customers say, of course. Now, 
you can argue with the ethics in this particular example and in today's era of transparency um it's a valid argument to make but the principle still holds and you can use it ethically we'll talk about how in just a second the important principle here is how you name it has a lot to do with how much it sells so first of all western union is alive and well today even though email text messages and services like fedex have put the telegram into the history books but i've used western union to send money to a friend who was in a jam and just this week an international client sent me some funds via, via western union because in his country it has lower fees than other ways of sending money but this point is not really about western union it's about how you name your product especially your upsell notice that when the clerk says fast he was verbally riding the horse in the direction it was already going that is the person was sending a telegram because they wanted to get the message to someone else fast straight wire was a confusing term and it meant nothing to the customer once again this is about getting into your customer's head a little more than you might already be doing and getting familiar with the language they're using or would use if they had to name something themselves in a favorable way What's your experience with naming upsells and things like that? Not just for upsells. I, I'm reminded of a book. Have you ever read Obvious Adams? Oh, yeah. So in Obvious Adams, one of the things that is kind of beaten to a pulp is just being simple and clear. A lot of times, especially newbie copywriters or business owners that are trying to write their own copy. They want to be clever. They want to show how witty they are with the way that they name things or the way that they position things. And obvious Adams, one of the things that was just, you know, over and over in the book was just keep it simple to explain what it is. And in a way that's easy to understand and fast wire is just easy to understand. Yeah. I, I think that's 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 a really good point, and it, it fits in perfectly with obvious atoms. Straight wire probably had to do with the internal routing of the wire. Who knows why they called it that, but it doesn't mean anything to the customer. Okay, that's good. So let's go to number three, which is sell the dream in your product, not the nightmare. And here's a pitch Elmer Wheeler tells about for a men's clothing salesman. This raincoat, made of the lightest material in the world, comes from Australia. Feel how light it is, says the salesman, and a sale is made, especially when the salesman rolls it up into a ball to emphasize how compact it is and invites the customer to put it in his overcoat pocket. Of course, you can do this kind of thing more easily in person when you can ask the customer to trap the product by rolling it up into a ball and slipping it into their pocket. But you can do something similar in copy. A couple techniques to think about here are future pacing, where you get the customer to visualize an experience in the future, and the use of your own imagination to create a scenario where the customer could observe something or do something simple to prove to themselves that the product is desirable and superior to other options in their own imagination. About four months ago, we did an Old Masters series show on G. Lynn Sumner, a very successful ad guy who wrote a book in the 1950s. He had a particular point of view on the use of imagination in your copy. He began by describing creativity this way. It is taking known facts, known elements, known functions, and arranging them in new patterns. He admits this is not easy because it requires focused thinking to do the rearrangement. Now, what about creativity and copy? And this is where Sumner talks about another important quality, imagination. He says, if creativity is the lab where, maybe this is what I said, but in any case, if creativity is the lab where new stuff gets designed, then imagination is the art department where it gets put together in the most appealing way. Stated another way, imagination is what you use to make your creativity add value to your copy. Sumner talks about watching his mother make a cake. 
the flour, sugar, and eggs would just sit there in the pan. The flour, sugar, and eggs were the creativity. Then his mom would add that magic ingredient, baking powder. And then when you put that in the oven, the ingredients would rise and form a delicious cake. Sumner goes on to say that imagination is the baking powder of copy. So you can follow this whole thing in greater depth after you finish this show by listening to the whole episode. And that was titled The Secret That Makes Copy Soar. If you've ever wondered how specifically do you use your imagination to write better copy, creating a future scenario for your prospect using your product, like the salesman at the start of the section was doing with the raincoat, made from the lightest material in the world is a really good example for that. One of the advantages that we have as copywriters, if we're good, is the ability to paint those pictures, paint the picture of the desired outcome, uh, paint the picture of how this is going to work for you. A lot of times I think where copywriters skimp is towards the end of their sales message. They say, Okay, so here's where you're going to buy now. And one one thing that I've seen work tremendously on low converting sales pages is just actually paint the picture of what happens next. You're going to put in your information, we're going to do this, you're going to get this, it's going to be delivered this way. When you open it, it's going to you're going to be able to experience this. This is how it's going to um this is how it's going to feel. This is how it's going to act. This is what you can expect. A lot of times we leave that out in our copy, but we don't have the advantage of here, fold it up and put it in your pocket. So if we can, through our copy, explain what it's like to fold it up, what it's like to fit in the pocket, why it's so awesome that, that it can fit in the pocket, um, how easy it is to fold it and fit it in your pocket. Being able to paint that picture is it, it's uh, an advantage that we have, but I don't see very many copywriters take advantage of it. Four weeks from the day we're recording this, you'll start to, because that's when this episode drops. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about number four, use similes to sell. Now, we talked about similes a few shows ago in a different way as a way to add emotional impact to your copy. Elmer Wheeler has another take on it, and it is good. It's not only for selling in person, but also for selling in copy. The idea is to use similes to take the prospect from the known to the unknown. Think about that. Why would you take prospects from the known to the unknown? Because people are comfortable with the known as a rule and uncomfortable with the unknown. And usually your product falls into the category of unknown. They've never heard about it before, so it's unknown. So what this selling technique does is it fuses the two. It takes something that is familiar and comfortable and compares it to what you're selling. I have some examples, and please remember that these are from a book published in 1940. This car runs as smoothly as a baby carriage. To describe something smooth, he offers this phrase. It feels like having your hands in soft water. And this one strikes me as really bizarre, but Somehow back in the day it worked. A drug salesman sold a particular drug by saying, it fizzes in your stomach the way soda water does in a glass. I mean, personally, I wouldn't like that, but um, who knows? Apparently some people did at the time. <laughs> What's the important thing? What's the important point of all of this? The important point is not to let the curse of knowledge slip you up. And what's the curse of knowledge? That's a really important idea from the book Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, which is a great book, by the way. What they're referring to here is what happens when you know your own product and all the conditions surrounding it. You get so immersed in your own familiarity with it, and you forget your customer doesn't know these things. And that lack of awareness on your part could greatly harm your sales because prospects will get confused by your shorthand explanation. And as we all know, the confused mind does not buy. Here, I'll give you an example. Let's say you sell very precise food scales for professionals in food prep or people where they need, um, they have medical conditions. They need to measure exact amounts of food to stay healthy. 
Now, suppose on the side, you, the manufacturer of this scale, are a big fan of cartoon music, but you've forgotten that most of your customers certainly aren't. So you might be tempted to create a simile like this. This new scale is as precise as Carl Stalling was when he set the tempo for his tunes in increments of one thirty second of a second. What? Now, for people who sync up music to film for a living, this could be instantly understandable. But everyone else is left dazed and confused. Not so good. So let's go back to the drawing board. What's a commonly known instrument of precision? How about the atomic clock? One of the most accurate timepieces ever. So a better simile for your food scale would be, this food scale is as accurate as the atomic clock in Boulder, Colorado, only about an hour from where Nathan lives. Nathan, I bet you've taken Bella to visit the atomic clock many times. Am I right? We have not yet, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bad guess on my part. But uh, what do you think about using similes to sell? I think if I could only add one thing to it is that when you when you use similes like this, it allows them to have like an aha moment, a realization, and that makes it feel like their idea rather than rather than you forcing it upon them. They're able to say, oh, I get it. And when they say, oh, I get it, they're much more likely to uh, personalize, embody that idea. It's part, it's their idea now rather than an idea that you shoved on them. They realized it. They came to the conclusion themselves. It's their idea, and they're much more likely to believe whatever is built upon that. That's a great benefit of similes I never thought of. I'm really glad you brought it up. It's really good. All right, let's do the last one. It's called Let People Save Face. Elmer Wheeler says, the fellow who explains best in a nice, kindly way sells best. When a prospect says he doesn't understand, a poor salesman says, well, now let's go over it one more time. And his tone of voice indicates he is annoyed with the prospect. But the good salesman says patiently, many people find this hard to grasp. Let me repeat it for you. Wheeler says, make the other fellow feel good. Say, I had a hard time understanding this myself. Don't show impatience. Don't be sarcastic. And don't shout. Wheeler says, the cop shouts. The modern officer explains. Well, a lot to unpack there. Now, all of this understanding may sound soft and wimpy to you. Don't believe it. Don't believe that it's soft and wimpy. It's not. It's much more sophisticated and it requires a lot more courage than it sounds like on the surface. My first coach and all around best business mentor of all time was Jim Camp, who was best known as a negotiation coach. Jim was a superb student of human nature. Seeing as he was a fighter pilot who flew bomber missions over North Vietnam, you wouldn't imagine he had a lot of subtlety to his approach in business. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. One of the first and most important things Jim taught me was let the other person save face. Now, the concept of saving face is a hugely important principle in many Asian countries, and it's not as widely understood or practiced here in America. Um, here in America, I think the principles get in your face a little more than safe face, but it's just as important and applicable here. What it means in ordinary American is get your damn ego out of the way and lead with your empathy. Don't be in such a rush to correct others or one up them. It works, and it's the same thing Elmer Wheeler was talking about in his book 80 years ago. I don't know if it was in a book that I read, or maybe it was an interview I was listening to from Bond Halbert, and he was talking about, in editing copy, the use of I versus the use of you, and when the copy is about you, the writer or the business owner versus the, the person that's reading it. One of the things that he said is 
on the rare occasion that he's talking about himself, it'll be the humiliating aspect of what the person is going through. So instead of being like, have you ever gone to the beach and your fat belly hung out and you looked so gross and all the girls laughed at you? Instead of doing that, he wants to be able to get that that pain point across, but he doesn't want to humiliate them. He wants to be able to have them save face. So he says, I remember one time when I went to the beach and I was trying to impress this girl and my fat belly fell out and she ended up laughing at me and all the other people looked at me all strange. And it's a great way to still get the pain point across, but it allows your reader to save face. I don't know how much that ties into this, but when you were saying 100%, that, that's, okay. that's great. That I've, I've never heard that before, but you know, Bond's such a brilliant guy and I love that idea. Um, yes. So that illustrates it in a very concrete way. Thank you. All right. So let's recap. There's five, points um, that we cover with lots of examples and discussion. Number one, speaking in your customer's language boosts sales. Number two, how you name your upsell and other offers, products matter. Number three, sell the dream in your product, not the nightmare. Number four, use similes to sell. And number five, let people save face. And we've got a link for the book Sizzlemanship in the show notes. Awesome. David, you promised a lot with this episode and you definitely delivered. This is, this is one of the funnest episodes I think we've done so far. Yeah, thanks. I, I agree. Elmer Wheeler, he's great. You know, the, the New Yorker article, I was um, telling another friend of mine uh, last night, it was, you know, so snarky and so condescending and so this and that. Um, because here was a man who was, you know, using language to make money as opposed to express literary wisdom. But um, there was a lot of good information and it was well written. And uh, so, but it was, it was a lot of fun to prepare. And uh, I've always wanted to do something in Elmer Wheeler, but it took until now to get there. All right. Well, I'm going to, I know that I'm going to go ahead and download the PDF version or the ebook version of this book. And, um, thanks again for bringing it to my attention and to the attention of the listeners. And if they want to check out more copywriterspodcast.com is the best place to go. And do you have anything that you want to leave the listeners with today? Whatever you do, make sure you check next episode out because we've got a guy who's writing movies for Jackie Chan, who's actually through Bond Halbert come into our world of copywriters. And he's going to talk to us about some unique stuff that'll be pretty interesting and pretty good and definitely help you. Even if you never write a single movie scene in your life, just if you're only a copywriter, which is pretty awesome in and of itself. Nice. Sounds exciting. And again, if you want to make sure that you catch that episode, subscribe to the podcast, copywriterspodcast.com. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.